So it's a great pleasure to be here back in France and at this uh, special event. And I would like to very much thank the organizers for making this marvelous event happen. So, yes, I would like to give you an overview um, in a bit of an educational way on you know, how we do exploring the transcript home. And uh, so I will start with what really motivates us, our goals and the hypothesis we go by. I will then give us, you know, some key facts about the, the system that we're really aiming to study because it's that pretty much decides which methods we should be employing. Then I will go introduce you to a range of methods that we kept developing over the years and corresponding findings in our, our wrap up. So, Let's start at the beginning. I mean, what, why do we get up in the morning? Um, and when I personally think of the transcript home, it's, it looks a bit like the picture on the right, where, you know, we have an in vivo system, and in there, you know, we have dynamic things going on. So there's transcripts of different kinds, and unless we learn how to to search for these things in an appropriate way, we will just simply not know what's all in there and you know what what life in there really is all about. So the transcript of in vivo, I mean it's obvious that you know it links the genome to any of its functional products. And the way this happens so much depends on the type of cell and its state it's in. So first of all, we need to know what the transcripts really are, you know, what are the monsters in the sea. And for this, we typically really need to know the full sequence identity. So you would think that today with all the sequencing technology, this is an easy box to tick, but if you actually bother to look into the detail, no matter whether you're doing a Lumina sequence or you know, Oxford Nanopore sequencing, you will see that we're still cutting corners and not all the transcripts that are around that are easily visible, say circular RNAs or other things. So for the purposes of this presentation, I will really focus on you know, understanding the mechanisms that regulate transcript home on RNA level. And in particular, the, the, the features that are mediated by RNA structure features. So let me briefly introduce you to what we mean if we say RNA structure. Because this can once again be studied on a, on a different level of abstraction. So we need to make sure we chose an appropriate one. So most textbooks will give you the figure on the left, which is the tRNA structure determined by X-ray crystallography. So you see something where pretty much all of the transcript is involved in making a 3D structure. Now it looks really busy, but if you stare for this for, for a while, uh, then you can actually translate this into the picture on the right where you flatten out the 3D structure and put it on the paper plane. And I think the most, uh, most uh, interesting feature which matters a lot to us computational biologists is that the key building blocks are really down to base pair and nucleotides. Okay, so this is, this is pretty much the level of abstraction that is good enough for most question that we want to study in terms of biology. So, and these pairwise interactions, they're not down to covalent bond, chemically speaking, but they're down to so-called hydrogen bonds, two or three of them, depending on which pair you're looking at. And um, we typically, you know, study any of these so-called six consensus base pairs down here. DNA, by the way, is a really bad example for introducing RNA structure because many of its nucleotides need to be highly edited for the whole thing to work well in vivo. But it's it, it's a good example in terms of appreciating what the what the building blocks really are. So what what are the key features of the transcript home in vivo that we should be aware of before we even start devising any computational method? So Let's try and pretend that we are transcript and you know we are entering live. So the first thing that happens is that you emerge sequentially, so from one end. And the speed at which this happens really depends on your biological system. 
There's a quite wide range of transcription speeds. Then people have quite early on found sort of detailed studies of select transcripts that the unexpected formation typically happens on the same time scale as transcription. So plus they really found out that if you if you adjust if you take a different polymerase, then you are actually, this can yield inactive um, RNA structure. So it does seem to matter. And by all accounts, there's no reason why RNA folding should not happen while the transcript is being made. And then several studies in the 80s and 90s have shown that Transient RNA structures, so these are structures that, that are only around for a short time, but not part of the officially functional structure, but they can have distinct functional roles. They can, for example, bind a certain ligand, as shown in the case of the Z and P ribose, which are here. And this interaction really decides which core folding pathway the transcript takes and then what the functional consequence of this really are, so whether you finish transcription or you don't. So this whole thing makes it, the, the prospect of being able to do any meaningful computational work fairly daunting, because it is complex and we need to take these things into account. So how on earth can we you know, have the hope of going from, say, raw sequencing data that we get you know, all the time these days to identifying the RNA structures that really matter in vivo. And, and this is where Darwin comes into play. So the only way around not having to model all the gory complexities of any specific in vivo systems are really to learn how to listen to what the transcript cares about if you just watch it for certain evolutionary times. So this is, this is pretty much what our methods are all about, trying to listen to your raw data to capture what's being, what's being conserved over well-chosen intervals of evolutionary time. So let me introduce you some of, to some of our methods. So this was work uh, published by a, a Canadian MSC student of mine. Uh, this is a method called Transet. And we, when we set out to devise this tool, any of the key RNA structure prediction methods would only ever give you a single RNA structure for any specific transcripts. And they were predicted in a way which assumes thermodynamic equilibrium. So you take a fully sequenced, synthesized sequence, drop it mentally in a pot of liquid, and wait for thermodynamic equilibrium to settle in. So this is not like the in situation. So we set out to devise a method that can detect also transient structures, as well as RNA structures, multiple RNA structures that may be encoded in the same transcript. So for this, we took a so-called comparative approach. So what you see here is an Underneath here is a multiple sequence alignment. So you do not only stare at your transcript of interest from your organism of interest, say, you know, a specific human RNA, but you really compile a multiple sequence alignment from sequences of related organisms. And then if you stare at this for a while, you realize if you look into these, say this is a um, this is a set of base pairs, so every seam circle is a base pair. And now you zoom into one particular pair of alignment columns, you realize in green that the primary sequence conservation is really high. But if you look closely, you realize that in blue, certain sequences have changed the primary sequence but conserved the basic pairing ability. So this is called core cool variation. And this is one of the key signals we're trying to quantitatively capture to detect conserved RNA structure features. And you also see that if you look at the orange stuff, which means invalid base pairs, that you know, for some sequences, you know, it's quite okay to have a bit of RNA structure variation, and you see this quite nicely. So by looking at these things, 
um, you can really kind of read off what the in vivo system on average cares about. So, in this method, we employ a fully probabilistic approach um, to which, which roughly goes as follows. So we start with the input multiple sequence alignment and the corresponding phylogenetic tree. Then you have a bit of clever dynamic programming to identify happen like RNA structure features in each sequence individually. You map it back onto the alignment. Then you do some quantitative magic that I'll explain in a minute. So that in the end, for every potential RNA structure feature, you have the so-called log likelihood value, but you also are good enough to try and estimate the p-value, so the confidence that you have in this RNA structure not being around by, by chance. So this is a little bit of quantitative magic that's implied. So for every candidate helix, so this is just a pair of regions in the input multiple sequence alignment that your hypothesis might be based there, we, we calculate uh, a likelihood value that this is base paired as opposed to unpaired. And the only way to really do this properly is to have probabilistic models of evolution that really spell out in quantitative detail how we expect base pair and base pairs and unpaired nucleotides to really evolve. So this is this gives us this log likelihood score with a bit of normalization and you know numerical rearrangements. So that in the end we arrive at RNA structural predictions that look a bit like this. So this is just a brief introduction to what we call R plots um, made by our in-house software. So <clears throat> you see the transcript or uh, the MS uh, multiple sequence alignment along the horizontal line, and the arcs are the, the ground truth, the base test. And then you can either, either visualize the predictions underneath. Or what you can also do is calculate a so-called sensitivity specificity plot where any of the known arcs are in non-black if they're true positives. And the false positives, so the extra stuff you're predicting, is underneath the horizontal line. And this is a really neat way of reading off the sensitivity and specificity of your predictions. So let's look at what we, for example, predict for the bacterial Hox systems. And the beauty is that because we're dealing with a fully probabilistic method, we can just apply different p-value thresholds. So we can just zoom in from 10 to the minus 2 on the left to 10 to the minus 3. And this gives us a clear picture. And this is a sensitivity specificity plot. So you can readily see that we manage to to correctly identify pseudonotic features as well as mutually exclusive ones, which pretty much no other method can, can handle. So here we have, for example, the, the complex predictions for the um, internal ribosome entry side of a specific virus. Once again, we can capture really complex things like these mutually exclusive and pseudonotic things. And most importantly is that you, it's very easy to make predictions, right? I can predict tomorrow's weather in a two-line power script if I need it. But what you really care about, you don't want to predict things that are probably not there. And the beauty of this approach is that, you know, if, if it doesn't find evidence for RNA structure, it will let us know. So this is one beautiful example of the tmRNA um, where the open read frame is really devoid of RNA structure features. And with any methods that is driven by chemical stability, you will never get this kind of prediction. It will try and maximize the number of base pairs, crudely speaking. So then we've been intrigued by the whole concept of core transcription folding for a while. Um, it's it, the old state of the art methods completely ignore it. But it does matter a lot to the transcript because 
it, it gives the transcript really a lot of guidance how it should fold efficiently, quickly, and robustly in vivo. So this is, for example, you know, a little transcript. It's being made. So maybe at this stage it can make this feature. And then as it keeps being synthesized, this RNA feature can yield to this one, which may be part of the final RNA structure. And this makes a lot of sense because it gives guidance to how the functional RNA structure forms in the end. Something you want to prevent is a situation like this where you could encode these two RNA structure features in your sequence and then you know, the, the, the sequence has to kind of decide which one to take. So this could, could get the, the RNA structure kind of kinetically stuck. So with this fairly simple idea, we came, this is almost 20 years ago now, we conducted a purely computational study where we took four lines transcripts of, um, with known functional RNA structure, and we defined fairly complex statistics with, which capture these different situations where you have a competing structure feature um, in relationship to the known RNA structure. So this is a good one because it can yield to the functional structure. This is a bad one which could get things stuck. And we found with, with great statistical significance that the transcripts really encode this information in their primary sequence so they encode way more of this stuff than of that stuff. They try and really prevent anything looking like this. So we then continued with the work and we managed to show that these transient features are as well conserved, typically even better than any of the features of the, of the official ground truth RNA structure. So, the folding pathway in vivo really seems to matter a lot um, to the system. It's pretty much like a lamppost you have to go through to get to your final destination. And then we come up with a method called corefold, which is capable of capturing the overall effect of co-transcription folding. So what you see here for the rather long 23S ribosomal RNA is once the prediction of RNA folds are M fold on top of the line, and all the red stuff are false based pairs of false positives. Whereas if we integrate the overall effect of co-transcriptional folding into pretty much the same program, this we get significantly improved RNA structure prediction accuracy as shown for our method down here. And then Something we did more recently was to see whether we can reliably predict uh, key transient features of the co-transcriptional folding pathway uh, in a purely computational manner based on multiple sequence alignments. And it turns out that this is quite possible and quite successful. So what you see here is the co-transcriptional folding pathway of the so-called ZTP virus switch. And this has been extensively studied experimentally, for example, by Julian Lux's group. Um, so there's a corresponding multi-author paper, and which basically reflects the work of you know uh, more than a year. And this is our this is our prediction based only on pure sequence, which really captures all the key features of this co-transcriptional folding pathway uh, really well. And this. Um, for less than an hour, so it's quite it, it's quite successful at, at detecting um, the features that matter. So to wrap it up, this part of the talk, the transient RNA structures really define define a co-transcription folding pathway in vivo, and we can predict these features. And back in 2017, I. I came up with the expression of alternative RNA structure expression, and that means that any biological transcript has in principle the capacity to encode multiple functional RNA structures, which are then really selected by the interaction with a specific in vivo environment. 
Um, so they really, the tribes really encode how they want to be handled by uh, different in vivo environments. So most likely we've been in the good position of, you know, having these exciting high throughput transcriptome wide methods that probe RNA structure features in vitro or in vivo, such as shape. Um, now let me briefly introduce you to shape probing. So there's a number of shape methods which differ slightly um, due to the chemicals that are being employed. But basically what they do is they, they take the transcriptome and they probe the rigidity of the RNA backbone and, um, and insert chemical modifications. Then you have a readout, a high throughput readout by looking at complementary cDNAs, which is then piped through sequencing. So what you get for every transcript is a so-called shape profile. And this shape profile is just, you know, um, for every sequence position, you have a value typically normalized between zero and one, which gives you a sense of the rigidity of that particular stretch of RNA. Um, and then the job of, for people like us is to turn this raw signal which no longer contains any information on specific base pairs, back into an RNA structure. So the problem here is, is that if you do shape probing on transcripts where the, like the 20S uh, ribosome RNA, where you really know what the ground truth structure is, you find that the distribution of reactivities between known unpaired and known base pair sequence position really has a huge overlap. So it would be downright foolish to attempt any threshold-based approach. So we've come up with a new method called shape sorter, which tries to integrate this experimental evidence in terms of shape reactivities into RNA structure prediction by combining this experimental evidence and evolutionary evidence. Um, so the way how this quantitatively works is to combine two log, log likelihood scores and pretty much in the manner that transit does, as I explained earlier. And what turns out to be really key is that we capture the linear correlation of shape reactivity values along the linear sequence, as shown here as well as the stacking interaction of base pairing uh, of neighboring base pairs. So using our method, which is once again employs a fully probabilistic concept, we can vastly outperform um, the, 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 the status, um, the, the best methods that were around back then, so RNA structure and shape knots by a large margin. So what you see here, is the F measure, so the harmonic mean of sensitivity and specificity. So we get vastly superior um, predictions, for example, for the human signal recognition particle. So we should see one, the prediction of shape knots on the left and shape soft on the right. Um, and likewise, for example, for the 5S um, RNA of E. coli. So I introduced you to a range of methods, most of which are based on, on the probabilistic concept, really. And I just want to highlight some of the results we got over the years in terms of biological data analysis. We showed quite early on that, you know, it's, it's uh, readily possible to encode more than a, a single function RNA structure in a biological transcript. We found that mRNAs and pre-mRNAs have really a lot of scope for encoding more local RNA structure elements, which are involved, for example, in regulating how translation is initiated or conducted, and most importantly, you know, how alternative splicing happens. So we made an early study of the human CFTR gene where we can really explain the, the, the exon splicing of one particular exon which causes a nasty human phenotype by um, the corresponding uh, local RNA structure features overlapping the splice sites. 
that viral genomes are usually of huge interest because of the space constraint, they often overlap um, RNA structure information, they have an overlapping in the reading frames. So we have a number of interesting studies there. The recent, most recent one uh, on influenza A, where we really show that um, the, the key splicing uh, isoform for the M segment, which is key for virulence, is really regulated by an RNA structure feature. So this is this, this paper over here. And then something which is of importance to, to us humans is that we manage to link a A to I editing, which happens in the nucleus of, of uh, uh, cells of the central nervous system, that this really can change local RNA structure elements and thereby yield um, splice variants which are specific to the cell types of the central nervous system. So this original study was conducted in a fruit fly, but the overall mechanism is also prevalent in humans. And then, as I told you, we can readily identify so-called primary switches, and this is work that's currently ongoing in the lab for, for the human organism. So to wrap it up, I think as computational biologists, we, we should really aim and focus on studying in vivo systems, because even though it's a very busy and dynamic environment, it's really the only one in which we can hope to learn how biological transcripts really behave uh, in their natural habitat. And what they do is really down to the other players on the dance floor, so what other transcripts and potential trans interaction partners are really floating around. And this obviously very much depends on the, the cell type um, of what you're studying. So for RNAs who are so exquisite sensors of the in vivo environment, in vivo is really the, the only deal. So for our community, I think the only real solution is, the, is to, to come up with experimental methods that allow us to pro probe the transcriptome uh, in a way that doesn't interfere with these structures so that we get a global transcriptome-wide readout and to really combine this uh, with the best methods and the best concepts on the computational side. And with this, I would like to thank my team over the years and thank you for your attention. Yes. Okay, thanks for the great job. Uh, so, I haven't seen in your talk any mention of deep learning, and we have Sorry? three of deep neural networks. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear Okay, you. now we have seen the revolution in protein structure prediction, and we see what's happening with the large language models and ChatGPT. What's your opinion or stand regarding using deep neural networks for RNA structure prediction? Do you see, we'll see the same revolution or breakthroughs? Well, it depends on. I mean, I, you know, I have training as a physicist and I really love to employ methods that teach me something about the data. And the method that we love to employ and devise are methods that, you know, they are, they are mathematically sane methods. They depend on a range of free parameters. They have a biological interpretation and there's mathematically sane ways to train these parameters. And if I look at the trained parameters, they tell me something about the system I didn't know before I got started. And this for me is, is why I love doing science. You know, I want the method to tell me something about the data I didn't know before. So, so that's the long answer. The short answer is they, they may very well generate superior predictions, but are you going to be any wiser why it happens and how it happens? And and, and that's, that's for me, is, is the concern. This is why we keep pushing um, these other computational frameworks so that we can, because, for example, you know, typically you get a choice of 
different computational models you could be building. And then by doing log likelihood fits of the models to the data, the data tells you which model to pick, which is adequate for the number of the amount of your training data. So you can check yourself whether you're that you're not overtraining your method. And this is extremely important because you can fool yourself into thinking you'll have a you have a wonderfully predicting method when it's just been hugely overtrained, right? It will do, it will recognize every cat photo you ever find on the internet. But if you expose it to dogs, it's not going to be able to, to tell you, recognize any dog, right? So I think there needs to be a healthy balance between, you know, getting great predictions, but then really asking yourself, you know, you need certain sanity checks and overtraining is certainly one of them. And for me, the second most important feature for any good solid method is, you know, can I train it in a mathematically sane way? And what does it teach me about my data? Do I get anything out of it I didn't know beforehand? And this is the case with our methods. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, um, the question is regarding our dividing quality. So uh, when we try to predict our dividing quality and, and integrating the in the features, the, the predictive structures, uh, it's often not added so much information. And and I wonder whether um, is the animal protein kind of overall those, 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 those structures because their you know, affinity to RNAs are stronger, or in contrast, whether you need a specific structure as far as I to add a protein to bind, or if there's an entire range of solutions out there. Okay, so, so what, what's your question exactly? I mean, I, I know what you're getting at, but. The question is. What's the general trend? You, you need first the, the structure, and then are dividing proteins bind to whatever uh, is in this folded RNAs, or what well, we the can other way around are just just change the structure with that. Yes, so I mean we can actually do both, and we see both. So I, I presented some method which give you you know multiple functional RNA structures. And if you look, I didn't show this, but we have published figures where you can almost read off the protein binding site because there's, you know, overlapping the RNA structure feature that we find there's higher than average primary sequence conservation, either in a structured part on it or in an unstructured part. Okay. Now, this won't give you the animated GIF of what happens when and how, but it gives you really good pointers to do, say, follow-up studies to, to know where, where the binding might happen. Okay. So one more question, and then we will share the session. You got it. <laughs> uh, thank you for this nice talk. So I was wondering how your methods generalize to longer transcripts because you have shown successful examples. Oh, that's a good, that's a really good question. Thank you so much because <laughs> I should have brought this in. Um, they scale extremely well with transcript lengths. And this is because we are not shoehorning everything into this minimum free energy structure. So our methods really don't care how long the beast is and they perform just as well, no matter how long they are. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a key feature. 